Good morning, guys. Good morning, guys. Welcome back to my Facebook live stream. My name is Jimmy Chang. I'm a professional photographer, filmmaker, and an Olympus ambassador. So if you're new to this live stream, it is all about, of course, it's photography, filmmaking, and Michael Forther, especially Olympus. Right. Welcome back to my live stream, and I'm very happy to be back because we're going to talk about something slightly different to my normal agenda. So uh, once again, if you're brand new here, and we usually follow some kind of structure which i am going to highlight to you guys now we have ta -da, this is it so uh, i usually separate my stream into like these three little parts here first of all I'll give you general updates about basically myself and then uh, what's going on in today's uh, uh, stream and also forthcoming stream in the coming days or maybe weeks even and uh, then the topic of the day and finally the q a of course so uh, you can answer me uh, so ask me any questions relating to photography, filmmaking, gear related stuff and anytime as and when you like and as soon as I see it from the comment section popping up there I will answer it according so it's not really just about uh, I would say um, uh, 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 I forgot now I forgot completely forgot what I'm gonna say because suddenly you know what Siri just talking to me this is so weird I have no idea what's going on there <laughs> okay Right, uh, Brad, good morning. How are you guys? Uh, thank you very much for joining me again today. So, um, yes, yeah, what first of all, let's talk, talk a little bit about general update. And uh, good morning, Ralph. Good morning. And uh, uh, yep, yeah, I'm still fine. The sun is definitely shining, summer is definitely, definitely arrives and uh, quite nicely so you know like um, uh, as you know I probably told you guys some uh, uh, some of you already from last week that uh, I had a barbecue and I had a barbecue on Monday it was brilliant and even though it was very short because uh, uh, you know it's only a small family you know we're a family of four so uh, two kids as well it's not the you know particular teenagers and things like that. so like we, we didn't really barbecue a lot of stuff so it's last about an hour or so but it's still nice to be just outside burning stuff you know smelling the thing and then eating it afterwards so it's all, it's all good it's everything's good so hope you guys had a good week so far as well and uh yeah i mean i'm, I'm short sleeve so uh, yeah you can see summer is definitely here now and uh, i and of course i'm mr perfect today because uh, uh, if you know that today, this afternoon, we're going to have a special Photography 101 live, uh, again, yes, live session in my YouTube channel, Red35 Photography. And that is going to be fun because I'm going to talk about uh, your most memorable cameras in your life. Yeah, this is really cool. So uh, it's not going to be Olympus specific. It's going to be anything that inspired you into photography anything that um that got you into photography or anything that kind of swing you from being a just as normal snappers into someone some someone who are more serious about photography and uh, so it's going to be interesting because i'd like to hear about all the story i mean of course i have my few on my own and uh, uh, to share so it's going to be a very very good talk so uh, the so far the community post that i post on youtube channel is, is already filled with a lot of comments so, so it's really good that i have a lot of story to tell already so that's good so if you haven't dropped down your story yet please go to my youtube channel uh, community page and leave your comment there and then hopefully i can share your story uh, live as well that will be really all good morning mark good morning good afternoon barana excellent so today we're going to talk a little bit about film photography because um yeah i've been talking a lot of, about um, uh uh, uh digital for a long time now is kind of like always oh, nice to mix and match a little bit uh, and uh, talk a little bit about analog so i did talk about i think maybe last week or so you know talk about instant stuff and uh, ray is the guy who speak to you know of course i think all of you have added ray as a, as a friend already and uh, ray is a very very good analog photographer i mean especially in uh, uh, in instant stuff He's a, he's a really, really cool guy to speak to. So, uh, okay, let's, let's, let's leave it at that. So today, let me just put up as the um, topic. This is the topic today. Photographic medium that you can still get in 2020. I'm more specifically referring to analog stuff, like where you can get films and things like that. It's, it is unfortunate the film or the analog market in general is a shrinking market. And uh, it, it, it's something that, I don't think it's no, uh, well, it's no longer appealing for the great market, uh, the great masses, you know, because everyone got smartphone now, and people who really want to snap don't need to get a point and shoot or one of these disposable cameras anymore. All they ever need is their phone, right? This is completely overtaking that market, which was the bread and butter of film photography. Actually, to be honest, is is everything you know including digital so we're going to come to that you know maybe maybe in the future but 
the smartphone market literally killed off the complete point and shoot market. And then um, uh, just like anything, film photography is relying a lot of consumable, which is basically negatives. So they, re and a lot of the subsequent businesses like the developer, the high street labs, they're all relying on people going there, drop their roll of films and, uh, and develop it. So they make money from those stuff. Then the market no longer exists, or even if they exist, it's really, really small and very, very niche at the moment. And especially there are more and more people are definitely um, uh, trying to develop films themselves now, you know, and to be quite honest, if you have the time, if you have the uh, uh, space, because uh, you know you, you do need space to develop the thing, because the chemicals, it smells, and also you need a dark room to, to develop, of course. And, uh, uh, but if you have that, it's actually more economical to develop yourself. And over time, you know, you kind of know exactly what sort of uh, settings and what sort of time you want to develop. So you develop your own skill sets and own specific uh, 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 style of look that you want to create because developing films affects a lot of stuff. I mean, colors, it, will, it, it will affects the saturations and stuff like that. And black and white, the contrast is affected by the durations of the, uh, uh, the developing and so forth. And also temperature is, uh, is also pay, play a big factor of it. So there's a lot of technical stuff going on there, but film developing is fun. And, I, and if you do have the time, you know, and there's still shoot analog that is, and uh, that is quite a, not, uh, quite, quite a good thing to do. So um, Mark <laughs> and uh, Holga, oh, you like Holga. I like Holga. And uh, although I'm, I'm never really the keen guy on Holga stuff, you know, and I'm a big fan of Lomography. Don't get me wrong, I'm actually a Lomographer, a Lomography Amigo, that's how they call the ambassador as well. So yes, I'm not just Olympus ambassador, I'm also an ambassador for, uh, for Lomography. I tested a lot of their stuff, I, uh, including film cameras, and uh, uh, instant cameras, prototype stuff, and films. You know, I, I test so many of their stuff, uh, which is actually amazing. So, um, but where can you get film these days? You know, I mean, these are easy, you know, because these are Instax cameras, and because they kind of come back in fashion in some way. So you can get, you can get like Instax film in supermarket. So that's how popular they are. Oh, having said that, I don't know if you've seen some of the reports, uh, I think early in the year, uh, they actually said that the instant market is also shrinking as of last year. And uh, it, it's, it's un I mean, just like anything fashionable, you know, and people at, you know, go through phases and uh, Instax market was booming because people were, uh, uh, you know, feeling a bit nostalgic and feeling a bit cool. You know, it's a young hippie thing to do. So like uh, the, uh, a lot of wedding parties, events, they, bought like absolute tons of instant cameras, uh, Instax cameras, and then uh, lying around for guests to take, you know, to put in the al uh, uh, album, guest books and whatever, something, right? So it became a huge market there. And even just some general people just taking Instax camera as fun. I mean, I, I use it, I used to actually snap my kids uh, every now and then to put, on, put it on the fridge, because it's actually pretty cool, right? And I still, much prefer a physical medium so I can see, I can see the prints more than just, you know, holding off a screen thing like that. Of course, this is convenience, but there's nothing beats a physical print on your hand. And I still really much prefer that. Um, that is still why, one of the reasons I still should film. And then, uh, and by the way, this is still kind of my go-to film cameras if I ever want to shoot 135. And uh, this is my trusty, trusty Leica M6 and this guy has been with me for many 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 and I mean many years I uh, love this guy and it really is built like a tank it doesn't really break to be honest and uh, I have his service and uh, I think he needs another service again I think last service was about 10 years ago um, the wrench finder is slightly out of alignment but it doesn't stop me from taking pictures because most of the time I actually stop down anyway I rarely shoot at f2 or 1.4 or something like that so uh, it's not too bad but I do like this because this is fully mechanical it doesn't really rely on any battery to operate so like, it's complete menu and uh, which is what I like about uh, film cameras especially the the older generation cameras when there's not much electronics going on um, but going back to psych, uh, uh, a slight uh, 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 you know the topic that I was taught, trying to talk about is where you can get them these days because used to be a really simple thing. You pop down to your local supermarket, your pharmacy, you know, uh, drugstores, uh, uh, you, you buy them. 
they were just lying around on the shelves and you can just pick them up. Sometimes, most of the time, they're like with some kind of sales, like buy one, get one free or buy two, get one half price, whatever, something, right? You can pick them up relative, relatively cheaply. You know, consumer level negatives and uh, like the uh, uh, Fuji, uh, uh, you know, uh, superior, you know, that they, 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 the consumer from they were really dirt cheap, you know, you can get them for like two, three pounds a roll. Yeah, it may be even cheaper if you get it on the right deals. And the Kodak, of course, Kodak Gold and all the others, you know, they're really, really cheap films. You can get them and don't don't get me wrong, these these consumer level negatives are actually pretty good, you know, and to us the latest stage of the, uh, 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 the film era, and uh, just before switching to digital, a lot of the consumer grade negatives were actually pretty darn good you know one of them that i really like is kind of like a slightly higher end consumer level film which was the fujifilm Reela 100 the grain size was so small and it's almost like a positive you know professional positive it's, it's really really fine grain so it means a lot of sharpness going on there so it really pinch up the uh, the colors with punches got the typical fujifilm kind of green tones to it uh, but i just love that film I bought a whole load of them, but unfortunately Fujifilm decided to cut that film off completely in about three, four years ago now. Uh, before it completely sold out everywhere, and I did stock up. I have a whole bunch of them in my fridge, uh, and uh, I don't know where I'm going to use them. I know it's, I know it's already expired, but you know it's something that I really remember and enjoy the shoot. You know when I was a younger guy, and then uh, I, I still love the look of it, and I still have a lot of film printed with that particular negatives. Uh, so that was my go-to kind of film. Um, but these days, if you go to even high street slabs, which do exist in the UK, we have Happy Snap, which is uh, kind of one of the remaining few high street labs that, uh, uh, that is still uh, you know, around for you to develop any negatives that you may want to develop. Uh, but even if you go to these stores, if you look at the shelves, you know, like they used to have wall, wall size cabinet and fridge. You know, you can like, pick and select what all kinds of different films there and now they reduce you like like a like a little bookshelf seriously it was a little bookshelf all they sell all they sell in there is like superior 400 superior 800 and then uh, a couple of ilford uh, films and maybe a couple of uh, a kodak gold 200 and 400 that's it and that's it. but they don't even sell positive these days they don't even sell uh, uh, triaxes, they don't even see like it. Seriously, they, you know, it's quite sad to see. I mean, it may not matter so much for the younger photographer who doesn't know much about film photography, but for me, you know, who grew up with films, and, and uh, I remember the golden days when, like, you can seriously go into a film stock, a uh, uh, film lab, you can smell the chemical, but you will be excited to see the, in, like, the entire collection hanging on the wall. And uh, it, it, it it's a thing, you know, it's a thing you go in there just to see, oh, what should I shoot next? You know, maybe I should try the Ektachrom, you know, oh, maybe I should try, you know, the, the Fuji 400H, maybe I should try the FP, FP4. It, it's exciting because um, a film looks and colors and tones, not depending on the camera body, unlike digital. Digital, you know, is all about the color signs that the uh, the, the camera manufacturer imposes on uh, on the actual sensor itself, and of course, you know, their processor will process the photos and da 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 da. You know, there's a lot of digital technologies behind it, so they look confused. You know, only just the re uh, the lens rendering, but the colors is all because of the processor and the and the actual sensor in digital cameras. But back in the old days, it's all about the film stock. The film stock gave you that character in terms of color tones and contrast it was amazing you know you can have totally different look if you're shooting the same subject same place but using different film stock so it was amazing you have to know your flavor you know it's kind of in a way very fun to experiment in the old days and uh yeah let's just jump in to have a kind of good morning sam and burana you saw the a oh you saw the a1 why didn't you keep it, it oh but you got the OM2N, okay, that's fine, that's okay. You still got the OM2N, <laughs> OM lenses and my bro. Oh, wow, okay, you got it. You got a whole thing up there. Learn how to clean and fix them. Yeah, to be honest, and a lot of the older mechanical cameras are so easy to take apart and, and fix them. And frankly, if you're really worried about, if you want to get into film photography, I think I did mention something like two or three weeks ago, you can go 
online and buy one of those Russian cameras, the Zenit E. You know, they are dirt cheap. They're like £10, £15 a body. Just the body. Yeah? The lens are dirt cheap as well, like £20, something like that. So you can get a whole outfit, working outfit, yeah, for about £30. Under 50 quid, you can get a whole setup. And then, um, and they're fully mechanical. So simple camera. If anything goes wrong, if you want to learn about fixing camera or learn about the inner gearing and everything, how it works, just buy one for experiment. 10, 15 pounds doesn't hurt your wallet. Just take it apart, learn about it. You know, it's really, really fun. And then, um, and also, and, uh, oh, Lee Fro <laughs> Mark said Lee, Fro Lee Frost has done some amazing shoots with Holger. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, there are a lot of really cool film photographers still around. And in the, those lomographer, you may actually think they're hipsters, but if you look at the good ones, if you go to the Lamarco website, they go to the community page and they look at a lot of the photographs and especially the popular ones, just be amazed how much they can create from a very simple film cameras and how much uh, uh, creativity, uh, creativity they, can, you know, they, can, they can generate from just using simple setups. So, that, you know, they are really, really amazing. Um, the, and Mark also said that very sad that when Kodak dropped their vibrant Saturday Portra 400, uh, well, what can I say? You know, Portra was, was, you know, one of the defectos, yeah, you know, to a lot of wedding photographers. They, uh, they, they love the Portra 400 and unfortunately, yeah, like you said, this, it, they dropped it. They may reimpose them, I don't know, and uh, we, we shall see. But at the moment, I think the only companies that are still really trying to bring back film and analog photography is Lomography. Uh, there are some other European and Eastern European uh, companies are kind of catch on the, the, the wave of the popularities of, uh, of analog photography, kind of have a slight resurgence in the last few years. But having, that, having said that, uh, you know, as of like kind of like towards the middle of last year, is starting, the curve is starting to flatten out again. And uh, whether the fashion is saturated or past or not, we don't know. Uh, I hope not, because I would like to see a, a lomography will continue to prosper and really having this force to push analog photography. I don't want them to disappear full stop, you know, because it is something, right? It's, some, it's not just, for, uh, you know, for nostalgic reasons, not just for memory reasons, but it's a part of photographic history. And I think this is something that I believe uh, it should be there. It should be there forever, uh, regardless how small the market is. But I completely understand it's the economy of scale. Uh, like, like, you know, what I, what I said earlier, the consumer level negatives used to cost about like two, three pounds a row. Now you can't even get them for less than like 10 pounds. You know, they are really, really expensive. Um, and that is one of the reasons why there are also less people shooting uh, film as well. And um, because they're expensive to buy also expensive to develop and also you know if you're really not sure what you're doing and you probably can't even get a good shot either so like you kind of discouraging just by using film and um, but if you're really starting to appreciate the process of making photographs uh, you know if you are really confident on making uh, uh, digital photographs and uh, uh, Try and try, just give it a try. You know, just go back and have a play with with analog, in, and uh, because you have less parameters to to mess around with. For instance, you can't change the white balance, and then uh, because each color film has a defect, uh, so default uh, a color temperatures to work with. If anything over or under, uh, you will have color cast, and then that means that you will have to impose a, 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 a put in a color filters to warm it up or cool it back down, just depending on what sort of situation you are in. And uh, uh, so there isn't much you can do about the colors in it. So it's almost just done. But if you shoot in the right temperature in the right em environment, you know you will be amazed just how good films really is, and especially the organic look and feel of it. It just it. It's just something, right? You know, and I just want to show you one, one quick, one quick picture. You know, this is something that I captured like a few years ago. You know, it's in the autumn time, and then uh, uh, just, just, just in the park, you know, in Hampstead Heath. Uh, this, this was actually a Fuji Reeler 100 um, that, uh, that I shot with. Uh, I still like this Fuji color. You know, it's it just amazing, especially the, the yellow leaves are coming out. Uh, kind of have a kind of nice complement to the green that Fuji is known for. Uh, so I, I kind of like the look, and uh, it's, it's, it was captured with, with this guy here. It's very straightforward film, but I just like the process. It's just fantastic, right? So let's see what Ralph said here, Ralph. And um, I misplaced my camera was found because I was using Ilford film. 
and uh, the camera was nickel matte. Ooh, you got some fancy stuff there, nickel matte. And uh, I love nickel matte, uh, but I don't have. I, I mean, I don't have, well, I didn't have actually any uh, many Nikon cameras and uh, I did use the uh, FM3, uh, which was one of the later mechanical models that they, uh, well, kind of semi-mechanical uh, model that I had uh, in the Nikon analog range. And uh, uh, so, in fact, I actually sold the camera for lost, well, not quite lost, uh, but, you know, it was a really nice looking camera and it's a very capable camera. I love the stroke, you know, the, the the, uh, the the actual rewind lever was so smooth, you know, and uh, I was actually quite amazed how good it was built. Uh, I, I regret, I actually regret selling it. I mean, I wanted to get it back actually. Um, so it's, it's quite unfortunate, unfortunately, and uh, something that I kind of regretted it. So selling it, I, mean, I should have kept it. I should have kept it. And uh, also, also, oh, you, oh, wow, I didn't know that you were supervising the black and white lab. Wow. Okay, <laughs> see, uh, Ralph can tell you all about like black and white uh, uh, developing then because uh, it is actually pro processing, you know, like developing black and white film is actually relatively simple compared to colors, and uh, 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 hence, you know, they there were a lot of uh, wartime photographers who used to just develop, you know, black and white films in the field because they're just slightly easier and uh, uh, and uh, they are more forgiving when it comes to processing uh, uh, parameters like temperatures and time so uh, you, you're not so bad with with that with, with that regard so uh, color is in contrast it's actually the opposite it's, you know have to be at the right temperature the timing has to be really perfect to get it right and uh, so i would still prefer black and white uh, and uh, to be honest because not only just they're simple but they give the message across really well, depending on the film stock you use. And uh, I love the actual grains in the black and white film, to be honest. I know a lot of people, especially fine art, uh, um, and a lot of photography, they really like the clean look from it. But as a street guy, as a documentary guy, I actually think the grains from films gives the life in the photograph itself. You know, I, I prefer it. I prefer seeing the grain and I say, oh, I actually, actually appreciate. And that's why I, in a lot of cases, I push the film two stops. I even use like really high speed black and white film like 3200. And then uh, I just want that look. I just really want that look. You know, something that you really cannot replicate in digital terms. And uh, it, it, I so much prefer, you know, the, the proper feel of the, the little dots in the, in the actual film itself. And, uh, <laughs> smell, <laughs> spell lamography. <laughs> Okay, Lomography, there you go. Mark, there you go, you got it, you got it right there. <laughs> okay, Lomography has some fun products, and uh, but watch how they... <laughs> uh, well, I know that, 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 can, that, can be the, that can be the danger, right? You know, if you go to Lomography website, and it, okay, even though I'm a, I'm a Lomography uh, amigo, and, uh, but apart from the film product or instant product, in a lot of the, uh, I don't think you should buy film cameras from them. And especially if you go to the website, look at some of the, the film cameras that they have. Uh, most of them are actually refurbished Russian cameras. Don't get from them because they are extremely, extremely, extremely expensive. You know, a Senna E, like which I mentioned earlier, you can get it online for about 15 quid. Yeah, I'm, I'm not joking. Yeah, 15 pound, yeah. You go to Lomography website, they sell it for 100 pound. No way, no way, you know, like, you can actually go online and you know, get about almost 10 of them and mess around with you know? <laughs> and so why get one from 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 Lomography and some of the lenses as well you know they they're selling extremely expensive as well for analog stuff and uh, you must you better off go online and just search for some of the older vintage lenses and adapt it to to the camera or just getting the same because the, uh, the, the, the Russian cameras are all using M42 mount, which is a screw mount. Uh, they're very easy to find, very, very cheap. And, uh, yeah, there are plenty of choices in the second-hand market. You don't have to buy from them. But for film stocks, they're cool. They've got some really interesting film stocks, that, uh, especially recently. They have launched uh, two or three new films. Go, uh, they all have uh, different flavors, different, different look, and different tones in the, into the, 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 uh, the stock itself. So, like... Yeah, try them. They're actually no, not much more expensive from the big boys like Kodak and Fuji uh, because they're all expensive these days. But if you really want to try them and then sometimes the Mography do offer discounts so, uh, so you can just buy them at discounted rate. So wait for the discount and, get, and just stock up a couple of film stocks. Uh, it's all fun. 
And、uh, let's see. Wow, Rao's been sitting for forty-five years. Whoa! You have to teach me a, few, a thing or two about Nikon because I really, you know, I have a lot of knowledge on Olympus and、uh, Canon and Leica, but you know, not so much about Nikon. Like I said, the only camera I ever had was the FM3A.、Uh, that was the only one that I have. Oh, Martin's going. Goodbye. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh no, he's not. Burana's going. Okay, so Burana, bye for now. <laughs> And、uh, wow, you got the Trix Plus the sixteen hundred. Wow, cool, cool. That is massive, sixteen hundred. Because Trix is actually four hundred, so like you, you're pushing two stops. Wow. I mean, I usually push about a stop, I guess. You know, I rarely push two stops. And uh, uh, but you know, if I'm starting to push that high, I'm probably actually using the high speed frame,、uh, sorry, high speed、uh, films instead.、Uh, so I actually get the sixteen hundred or thirty two hundred. Uh, a film stock, cause I I really do like those look. This heavy grain is just amazing, and、um, yeah, that is really really cool. So yeah, I I think this is kind of thing that I want to share with you guys at the、uh, uh, about analog. My my passion still lies to us.、Uh, A lot of the, a lot of the、uh, the the analog photography because I grew up with it, you know, and something that I don't want to lose it, especially you know you uh, uh, and uh, this is actually portrait, portrait four <laughs> hundred, and uh, uh, so uh, it's it's something that I I will feel sad if I see it disappear, and、uh, especially nowadays I okay I don't shoot as much、uh, negatives these days, you know, like I still take my My M6 out, you know, every now and then, and、uh, but to be frank, because most of the time that I do go for shooting is mostly shooting for my clients, which is commercial, which I use digital. So analog is really kind of、uh, when I go out, have a day off for myself, you know, just going to do nothing but photography, just have a stroll around town and and things, and then I will carry a film camera, and that's that's when this guy come out, and、uh, have a roll or two films, and I will just photograph. So the chances are. Getting rarer and rarer, which is, in effect, you know, I I feel quite a little bit sad about it because、uh, I should be using a little bit more analog stuff,、uh, but it doesn't. I mean, I don't have the time for it, so I can't justify the cost of, you know, developing all of it, and not so much about buying and also developing. It's more about the time of uh, uh, reviewing them and also,、um, uh, you know, just trying to. Compile the、uh, the photographs and and into something that it means something because I don't want to just photograph it for the sake of it. I mean, even if I go out with a film camera, I'm still trying to shoot something slightly more meaningful. So I go out for a pur-、uh, with a purpose in mind. So I don't just go out and yeah, just snap something and lock time. Yeah, go and do it. I don't do that. You know, that's that's not that's not me.、Um, let me show you another photos. And、uh, this is another street. Also, Portra 400, and、uh, I love it. And like I,、uh, like you said, that is slightly desaturated, and I just love the skin tone from Portra 400. It's just amazing. And once again, this is from Malika, and、uh, it's one of the street moments. I thought it was really, really cool. That especially she gave me that look when, as soon as it came out from the car. And I was, you know, I was actually waiting for her to pop out in the scene, and、uh, and because、uh, I knew she was coming through when I was walking, and so I just kind of like turned. Into the back of the van and just waited for her to, to turn up. I think she knew I was there, so that's why she just turned around and looked at me. But I want I want to capture that that look, and、uh, but obviously, she may or may not do it,、uh, do it. So I just kind of wait. If it happens, it happens. So I still snap. I still snap the frame anyway, regardless, and、uh, just in case. But it was cool. It was good fun. You know, that's why I like street photography. A lot of uh, uh, uncertainties, a lot of unpredictabilities there, and、uh, something that I truly, truly find it fascinating and fun.、Um, let's see what Mark is saying here. People complain about Michael Four Third、uh, quality about sixteen hundred, but in film days, yeah, I mean like you, you got a bang on there, and I think. This is exactly the point I'm trying to make for many, many, many years. Not just because Michael Four Third, but in general, you know, like camera manufacturers keep hyping up the high ISO sensitivities,、uh, uh, the high ISO capabilities. But what is the point? If you are a genuine photographer, if you are a genuine uh, uh, capable photographer, you know for a fact that. You don't shoot thirty two hundred, sixty four hundred constantly. I think you are doing something really, really wrong there. I think those 
High ISO are for specific usage only. Let's say if you're in a stadium, you really want to freeze the frame, or you're in a very, very dim environment, you really need to uh, 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 like, you know, see something, like more like paparazzi, reporter kind of thing. Those situations, by all means, yes, shoot and high ISO. And uh, because in that case, you are, your purpose, your aim is to get that shot. It's not about quality, but if you are a photographer really looking into quality, you should be shooting a lower ISO, faster glass, setting on tripod, do something that do maximum the actual quality of every single pixel, right? You know, this is exactly the point I've been making. Not just because Michael Forster, I said it when I was in Canon, full frame. I said it when I was at Leica. You know, I said it, with, if anything, you know, like, People keep saying, oh, you know, anything above 600 is shit. Everything over 6400 is rubbish. You don't use 6400 like every single day. You don't use 6400 like from morning to, to evening. You don't, do, you don't do that. You know, for high ISO, anything be, beyond 3200 in my case is for emergency purposes. If I really, really do need to catch that shot, it's like basically have it it's better to have it than nothing, then I will use 3200 or 6400 even. But that is more like an emergency thing. And uh, in most cases, I should 6400, uh, sorry, uh, 1600, 1200, that's kind of like my go-to if I'm shooting in lower light situation. And because uh, a lot of the cases I use faster glass anyway, like 1.2 or f 1.8 lenses. So I don't really have to stretch that far, to be honest. And unless of course, you know, you're going for super fast uh, speed uh, action stuff like let's say uh, 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 in a football field where, where there's a runner running at 20 miles an hour kind of thing and then you you want to freeze that frame in the air and that may be slightly different but in a lot of cases the sports stadiums are very well lit and uh, but you know I can understand that you still want to freeze the frame you may want to use the one thousandth of a second or something like that in that case you may want to push it to 3200 or 6400 I get that um, but and once again that is a very specific very purpose uh, purposeful images that you want to capture but in most cases people really should not be drilling the the negativities of uh, something that cannot shoot high ISO because in many cases you shouldn't really be looking at that anyway it's a marketing thing that people have been pushing into and believing into that is a better camera but if you look at across the board not just Michael Forth not just about Olympus but across the board all cameras like I mentioned that so many times that they are all capable these days you know like anything can you know you can look at them you know be uh, like below 1000 they're all very clean very nice saturated contrasty the colors are really good so you shouldn't really be worried about too much and uh, yeah it gets annoyed but sometimes i know i just need to explain once again and uh, let's see <laughs> um how many can still load the film uh, load the film real <laughs> true not many now. I bet not many people can actually load load one. And uh, my uh, my brother and I used to lo uh, uh, used to load them. It's still, we still we still have the bolt. We still have bolt reels uh, in the fridge. I have uh, quite a few stacks of, actually. So we have all the equipments to roll to roll the film cans and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, but like you said, I don't think many people can do it. And to be honest, probably can't be bothered to do it. Uh, but they are cheaper if you buy a roll. Uh, buy actual uh, roll is actually quite cheap. One thing I think is quite sad about in, especially in the UK, is uh, you, you can't. Well, it's expensive to actually get film cans. I know you can recycle them, um, but in the, in Hong Kong, you can actually get film uh, film reels, and then also uh, 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 as soon as you buy them, you can ask the the lab to give you a whole bag full of empty cans from the developing for you for free, or from dirt cheap money. So that's cool. Right, and it doesn't happen in the UK, but in Hong Kong they give it to you the whole back of them, so you can reuse them. And I love it, recycling. That is all good. Um, let's see. And Brad, your first camera was uh, was a child's model, chunky orange plus the incredible Hulk on it. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. I like that. I like that. And, uh, well, many do. My my kids got the two toy cameras now. I'm training them. Hopefully, they will become a. Uh, 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 interested in photography so like we can have something in common so we can play with when they grow a bit older and, uh, and has a little plastic window <laughs> oh that's funny 
Oh, Kodachrome 25. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's that's a proper film, my friend. Kodachrome 25. Whew. Slow film, but super nice. Super nice, super saturated. Uh, uh, that is something that is, is, is becoming a classic. A cult classic, actually. But then, um, even that, no one can actually have it now because it doesn't exist anymore. So unfortunately, that's something that it will can only be dream about it and, uh, and 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 also i you know i was too slow to get some stock you know and when the time when they stopped making them unfortunately so uh, i don't have any kodak crumbs anymore so that's another sad thing I, mean, I have a lot of different film stocks in my fridge but none of them is in kodak so because i, I once well, when i was a film photographer i'm more of a fuji guy not so much of a kodak guy but at uh uh, I do admire Kodak because I, I do use the portrait. I do use the portrait 160 and 400 a lot and uh, uh, so that I do like Kodak stuff but just slightly more Fuji. <laughs> um, so when you got into photography, the AP... Oh, who remember APS? Gosh, APSs. I remember them. They're really funky little cartridges, yeah? You know, it's all automated. You know, there's no... There's a lot of negative. You have to pull the film out. You can put it into the, the uh, when you load up the camera, you have to really pull it out and just put it correctly before, otherwise it won't spin. And then uh, the APS is completely automated. There's nothing to pull out. You just slot the whole thing into the bottom of the camera, close the uh, the, the lid, press on, it's everything automatic. But the downside is, of course, you know, and then uh, you cannot recycle them, and uh, which is actually a bit of a bummer. Um, the, also, the negative size, I think, is slightly smaller as well, and not as much as the uh, uh, the the uh, the proper one three five. But that's the effect. You know, it's more almost like a crop sensor thing. So like, when you have APS camera, that's why the APS camera is actually smaller compared to the traditional one three five, and uh, it's kind of like what we have today now with the APS C cameras compared to the full frame cameras, exactly the same thing, and. Um, and also all about uh, 110 as well, and 110 is almost like the Micro Four Third, like I mentioned uh, previously. The film size of the 110 cameras were actually about the size of the Micro Four Third sensor, uh, so they are even smaller. So I, I wonder if like anyone can develop a digital Micro Four Third camera that is as small as the original 110 camera. That would be awesome. I would buy a shitload of them because uh, they're so tiny, really, really cool. I mean, you can, sh you can, you can have a professional, professional thing, you know, an uh, outfit in, in, in a small kind of woman handbag. <laughs> How cool would that be? Uh, oh yeah, I remember those APS-C. APS-C is like cool, man. And Mark, and you said in 35 mil SL days, uh, everyone had a flash. Now people just rack up their eyes. So yes. That's also very, very true. Um, and to, then to be honest, you know, I, I do like using natural lights because flash does in some way destroy the, the ambience. And uh, I, I, mean, I can't totally get that, especially when you go to uh, like indoor environments, for instance. However, like I said, you know, you can still do like it because I would say in, in those days, a lot of people don't have 1.2 or f1 lenses because they are actually extremely expensive they are expensive now but in, in the film days they're even more extreme extremely expensive most people have 3.5 lenses so uh, uh, so when you go into a dark environment for instance a lot of the films in there were like 200 400 that means like they are way too slow in indoors so that's why they pop a flash out and uh, uh, if they had like 60 1600 film you know if you have a 1.2 lens you can get away with just just the lens itself no flash needed um so i guess it's give or take nowadays it's easy for us to just click a button and just turn it iso dial to whatever numbers you want to but in the old days whatever film you stuck in the camera you're pretty stuck you know you you have to either finish the, uh, the whole roll of film or you just have to bring a second camera that's what most pro did uh, in my days, you know, we had two or three cameras with us with different film speed in the camera. So we know exactly what we're shooting. If we need to shoot in low light, we just change over to the high speed. And in outside bright daylight, we're going for a slower speed uh, uh, and so forth. You know, this is a very common practice. So I had uh, used to have about like two Canon uh, film bodies on me. And uh, at a wedding, I can just switch over with whichever films I want to use uh, and so forth. Or even the look, black and white or color, I can choose. So that was fun, wasn't it? And then, uh, but 
all these hassles is kind of gone away now in digital world. It is, it's all a click of a button. You can change that. You can change black and white colors, ISO, anything. It's so different, so different. Okay, let's see. And, uh, ooh, and Rav also should RB67. You got that. You got a 6.7 is a big thing. You know, this is another thing about people uh, talking about medium formats these days. And uh, uh, in digital uh, medium format cameras, they just don't get the same aesthetic in my eyes compared to the olden film days because they, the digital uh, sensor in the medium format is actually quite a bit smaller compared to the 120 that you have in the film days. It doesn't matter with six by six, six by seven, even like like seven by five. It doesn't really matter. You know, they change the uh, the, the the whole aesthetic because the negative side is so different um, than uh, the in in the old days. It can be massive, like six by seven, for instance. Yeah, if you look in the digital medium format cameras now, I think is probably half the size of the six by seven. So like, even though they call medium format digital, but they're not anything like a medium digital format no nothing you know if you look at side by side comparison the the depth of field the actual rendering of it no way you can get the same look so uh, if you're really craving for that medium format look i think the only way is still shooting with film so like uh, that's why there's still a lot of photographers still shooting medium format film because it's that aesthetic they really crave for that does, it cannot be replicated in the digital world it's just because it's different it's just not the same and full frame Yes, because they are full frame. They are proper same 30, 36 mil for, uh, 30, well, 135 format, exactly the same size. So that you still get the same aesthetic digitally, but medium format definitely, definitely different. And uh, and hence I haven't jumped onto the medium format uh, digital because uh, I mean expensive, of course, you know. But it look it just still different, you know. Like I still have a lot of six by six. I still have six by uh, six four five, uh, not six by seven, but I have six uh, six four five. I still have them. And then, uh, uh, so I still prefer that look of them. It's just so different when you're coming for a digital uh, a medium format cameras these days. So that's why. Okay, cool stuff. And uh, I think I'm gonna end today's stream right here because uh, I talk a little bit of geeky stuff today, you know, a lot of uh, uh, analog stuff. I know it's not something that people may understand, maybe, maybe even appreciate, just because it's, uh, it's for people who are as old as I am, <laughs> or at least have touched uh, film cameras before. Um, the modern day photographers now, you know, they, they more worry about, you know, smartphones and megapixels. And like you said, you know, the, uh, the high ISO capabilities and kind of things. And it is, it's very, very different. Uh, you know, when you go looking back at a lot of stuff, you know, it does make me feel a bit nostalgic. You know, whenever I touch a film camera, every time I hold this bad, bad boy here, Whenever I go out and shoot with these things, it just it just brings back all these old memory. And uh, my next acquisition, if I'm going to get a film camera, I'm going to get the uh, the Olympus M1 or the uh, the uh, the OM3. These are the two cameras I want to get uh, in the Olympus analog world. I do have some Olympus cameras, but I've never really had the OM camera, even though I have a lot of the digital stuff. But I don't have a OM analog cameras, which is a, a bit of a shame. You know, I'm an Olympus guy now. I should actually have one. So uh, I may actually go and grab one uh, at some point, and uh, but I'm still looking for a nice, nice uh, uh, thing that I want to have because I want to get a couple of lenses as well. I just don't want to just go in there and get a kit lens. So uh, I'll, I shall see what sort of thing I I can see on the market. Uh, but anyway, so remember today, today this afternoon, 3 p.m. GMT, I'm gonna have a, a special. Again, once again, I'm feeling a bit nostalgic. This is the theme of this week, I guess, and uh, about your most memorable cameras. So I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to share a few of my own experience, my few memorable cameras in my life. And uh, I've already got, like I mentioned, uh, in my community post on YouTube, people already flooding with comments and talking about their favorite or their most memorable uh, cameras already in there. So like, I have a lot to talk about a lot of uh, experiences, a lot of stories. So I'm hoping to, uh, that if, uh, if you haven't been there yet, you know, go in there, just put on your, your, your story behind, which camera you, uh, is your most memorable. It doesn't really matter. It's not about Olympus. It's just about things in general, which camera got you into photography, which camera really got you 
uh, or the changing point in your career, you know, that you know, something that means something big for you. I think that will be really, really, really cool. <laughs> and uh, no, thank you. Thank you guys for joining me. And uh, thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Brianna. And they're all good, all good. And uh, yeah, thank you again. And uh, like looking in the rear view mirror. Exactly, you know, and uh, I know it's in the past, you know, but sometimes you do have some really good old memories that you really want to dig it up and then just revisit again and just see, and just put a big smile on your face whenever you see that photos or that camera kind of bring back that memory. And because you can easily see that, oh man, I remember this, you know, I used to do this with whatever. This is exactly what I want to see, what I want to hear, because uh, it will, I hope, I hope there's no tear. I mean, even if there is tears in it, I hope there will be happy tears. It's just uh, so many things that really transform my career or change me as a photographer. Uh, so uh, there, there are a couple of cameras I want to talk about in today's uh, 101 this afternoon. So be, remember to join me later on. It'll be fantastic. Okay, guys, I shall uh, end it right here. And remember, 3 p.m. <laughs> Okay, in that case, I will speak to you guys tomorrow uh, uh, if you're not going to join me this afternoon. Um, Ralph, I know that you said uh, you want to talk about uh, a live stream. I'm, I will do a special live stream uh, uh, YouTube live, hopefully. And uh, then I will talk a little bit more about setup and also um, how you can create uh, some sort of fantastic app using my wireless stuff. See, I'm setting it up for this afternoon so, um, because I want to go outside in the garden because it's nice and sunny outside. I want to go outside and talk you know, rather than sitting here. But uh, the, we shall see how that works. So I still want to see your comments because I want to react to you guys. Um, but if I can't see comments when I'm out there, then I have to come back in here to respond. So uh, we shall see what happens because it's all live and uh, sometimes technology works, sometimes it doesn't. It's really, really hard to judge. But anyway, thank you guys for joining me. Really greatly appreciated. And remember, I have a buy my coffee link up there. If you want to buy me a coffee, it's all good. And uh, if not, doesn't really matter. We're all friends here. We are. I mean, like you, like I said many, many times, that you've you, It's all because of you guys. I'm here every single day and uh, talking about things. And I do sincerely hope that I will meet you guys uh, in person. You know, at some point. Uh, I know some of you in London, so it'll be bit easier for me to meet up but uh, some people who are abroad will be slightly more challenging you know especially with today's climate and uh, travel is restricted heavily um, so hopefully in the next year or two three years no matter what if you're around I'll be there so be ready for my visit <laughs> okay guys I'll see you all soon and then uh, I will let you guys know what's coming up next week because I have some announcement I'm still waiting for people to confirm my proposal and uh, hint hint is big because I want you guys to get involved it's really cool so until tomorrow until later this afternoon I'll see you all very very soon thank you bye for now <laughs>